Hello everybody, I'm Tolis Tokianos coming at you from Apex Video Marketing Studio here in Zurich, Switzerland, and we have an exciting episode for you tonight. It's all about Team C's and we're helping people around the world by raising awareness for the Team C's campaign, which is a global initiative led by the YouTube community, specifically by Jimmy Donaldson, also known as Mr. Beast, and my beloved Mark Robert, NASA scientist and YouTuber extraordinaire that makes some awesome videos. And both of these people are highly influential people throughout the YouTube community, and they have taken the initiative to organize and launch this campaign known as Team Seas. And our goal is to raise 30 million United States dollars by the end of this year. In other words, by the 1st of January, 2022. And with that money, we want to rid the world of 30 million pounds of plastics from our seas, rivers, and oceans. And the money that's gonna be raised is gonna go 50-50 to two specific um, companies or organizations slash institutions. One of them is called the Ocean Cleanup, and the other one is also known as Ocean Conservancy. Both incredible organizations that are extremely active and doing what it takes to rid the world of plastic. And it's very exciting to be part of this community because first of all, me as an end user, as a consumer, I've learned a lot about plastic pollution and what I personally can do to help get things much better in the world around us in which we live. I'm originally from Greece. I love the sea. I used to sail a lot, windsurf a lot. I used to do a lot of swimming as a kid, winter and summer. And you know, the sea in, in Greece, the Mediterranean specifically, is something that is extremely dear to me, brings back a lot of childhood memories. And it's a real shame when I actually come across floating plastic objects in the sea above the surface and below the surface. And it's really, really not a nice thing at all. And it's just, Terrible. And when you think about how we want to leave this uh, world for our future generation, well, it's time to do something about that right now. And today I got two special guests that are joining us, and I'm happy to introduce to you in just one single moment. One moment, please. And let me just pull them up on the screen. I'm managing a, <laughs> a show, and I got to do all things at the same time. Bear with me, guys. Here we go. It's all four of us, actually three of us. And uh, we got Joe on the bottom left-hand corner and we've got Leah on the bottom right-hand corner and above left-hand corner. We can actually see what the latest update of Team Seas is today. Let's have another quick look. We are now at $17.8 million worth of money raised for this campaign. It's very exciting. We still have a ways to go, however, and today's show is all about giving that extra little push to help raise the awareness and allow people the opportunity to actually do something by donating and becoming a member of Team Seas at teamseas.org. Now, um, $17.8 million is the equivalent of 17.8 million pounds of plastic removed. That is how much the two charities or the two institutions involved that we are supporting are gonna be able to remove from the ocean. And there's some incredible technology that um, has been implemented by the Ocean Cleanup. And the Ocean Conservancy has been active for many years in doing a lot of beach cleanups as well. Some of the things that you can do as well as a consumer, no matter what country you live in. So what I would like to do real quickly is let's get some introductions. And I would like to welcome our very first uh, guest. We have spoken once before. And that is my friend, uh, Leah Colabello. Just one minute while I get her up on screen. All right, just a minute, Leah. And there we are. There's my friend, Leah. And how are you today? So great, Tolis. Beaming in live from the North Shore of Hawaii on the island of Oahu and just across the street from Sunset Beach, where I love getting reacquainted with the Pacific Ocean. The last time we talked, I was in Charleston, South Carolina, just coming from surfing on the East Coast mm -hmm. in the Atlantic Ocean. So, um, but unfortunately, plastics are on beaches everywhere. And I spent a lot of time walking the beaches and picking it all up. Yeah, I totally hear you. And you know, the, um, the unfortunate thing about it, and it's not just beaches, it's also, 
It's also um, <laughs> multitasking here. It's also rivers as well. Here in Switzerland in particular, there's lots of beautiful rivers and um, a lot of people do their part to clean up rivers, you know, the shores of the rivers. People actually swim up in our neck of the woods here in Zurich um, in the Rhine. And so that's a very important part of the ecosystem that's also being kept clean. And then of course, let's not forget the lakes. So um, there's lots to be said about the different bodies of water on this planet and how they contribute to ocean plastics. So um, let's go into some more detail in, in um, just a moment. What I'd like to do now, Leah, with your permission, is I'd like to introduce our very next guest, and I'm very excited to have him on board. Um, actually, why don't I let you do the introductions? This is a great idea because I'm super excited that one of my colleagues, Joe Gugino from Costa Sunglasses is here. Costa is particularly concerned about the amount of single use plastic entering into our watersheds and then getting into our rivers, lakes, streams, and ultimately in the ocean. And so with all like, like heading on over to Joe Gugino to talk a little bit more about why the company started this initiative and what they're doing about it. Awesome. Joe, welcome to the show. We're very excited to have you here. How are you today? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Oh, that's great. I'm really glad that you're with us. And um, so tell us a little bit about uh, where you're located currently. So I am calling from the East Coast of the United States in Boston, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And how's uh, the weather over there? It is very cold. We have snow on the ground. I'm looking outside on the <laughs> roof right now. And um, any idea what Boston Harbor looks like these days? Is it frozen? It doesn't really ever freeze, but uh, there's definitely in some of the back bays you get some ice over and things like that. So uh -huh. I believe it has just started. Winter has just arrived. Okay. I remember being in Boston and we were down at the Boston Tea Party. Is it the uh, USS Constitution that's in the, in the harbor there? Am I correct in saying that? Yep. That is there as well. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. And I remember when I went on that boat, uh, or on that ship rather, I was, uh, I was keen on throwing a big crate of, um, well, I guess it was empty, but it was supposedly full of tea and they kind of allow you to throw it into the uh, harbor and then you got to pull it back up again. But when, I'm not, when I went there, the ice was completely frozen. We're talking like 25, 30 years ago when I was um, out living in the States. So very exciting to have you and um, living in uh, Massachusetts must uh, bring you close to the sea, I would, I would gather or the ocean rather. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I'm looking at Boston Harbor from my window. So I'm on the water, similar to Leah mm -hmm. in a different way. She's out surfing. I'm usually out fishing myself. So I'm on the water <laughs> more than half the year. That's for sure. That's great. That's great. Well, you know, I think we all have that in common. Um, you know, I've got the Mediterranean, Leah's got the Pacific Ocean, you've got the Atlantic Ocean, three major bodies of water. And um, I'd love it if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, Costa and what, what you guys do over there. For sure. So Costa Sunglasses, as Leah mentioned, we are always ocean first. We specifically make sunglasses as the name is there, but uh, what we stand for has always been more than just sunglasses, which is what attracted me to the company when I was out on the outside as an ambassador for a long time and then jumping on full time. Um, my position currently is conservation and community partnerships manager, which is a mouthful, but something I'm very proud of. And so I work with our fishing communities as well as our coastal communities in the country and across the world. And so what I stand for, as you brought up on the top screen there, is Kick Plastic is one of the initiatives that Leah helped start with Costa many years ago. And now I get to continue to work with her on um, here at Costa, which is super exciting. Oh, that's great. That's really great. And I remember when, when I was talking to Leah for the very first time, um, I think this was in October, Leah, we had our first show together. Uh, we spoke about kicking plastic, and that's a term that really resonated with me. It actually stays in my mind, so I actually use kick plastic all the time. I like using hashtag kick plastic, so I guess it's your guys' claim to fame, isn't it? For sure. Yes. Definitely claim to fame, but we're glad for people to use it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Absolutely right. So now tell us, you also um, have some other campaigns that you're promoting or running in, uh, at Costa Sunglasses, one of the ones that comes up to, um, well, that was shared by you guys is the Untangle campaign. Can you tell us more about that, please? For sure. Uh, Leah, do you want to kick it off or do you want me to? doesn't matter to me. Nope, go for it, Joe. 
I, I can talk more about Kick Plastic after you hit Untangled. Deal. So yeah, so Untangled, Kick Plastic is more of an overall movement that is ingrained in everything we do, both at the company and in our communities. Um, Untangled is a specific product line. So Untangled is um, the taking what with our partner. There you go, Leah. Thank you very much for showing it off. Ooh, hang on, uh, hang on a minute. They, uh, hang on. You caught me off guard oh. there. <laughs> Let's get Leah. There you go. Oh, that looks really cool. So tell us more so about that. Side there too. Yeah, so the Untamed collection started, I think the first one was 2018, was the first one we came out with. And they were, they're made of recycled fishing nets. So our partner is Boreo. So they go to South America, take uh, commercial fishing nets out of the ocean, mm -hmm. and they repurpose it into little plastic pellets, which we use to make sunglasses. They use to, uh, looking good, Leah. <laughs> they use to also make other products like skateboards and now into clothing and hat brims. Um, but we are super pumped because we get to take that raw material that's recycled and reused and make it into durable sunglasses that people can use all year round and not only represent the coast to sea, but say, hey, this product, I kick plastic in my life, but then, hey, this product specifically helps take plastic out of the ocean. I can now wear it. Right, right. That's really exciting. Leah, what's your experience with all that? Well, kind of riffing off of what Joe was saying, it was really important for Costa to find a partner with an incredibly transparent supply chain. And you can look up the team at Boreo. They have, you know, they're four guys that were trying to figure out what can we do to solve this massive issue of ocean plastic pollution. And they were down in Chile and they decided to figure out how can they retrieve damage into fishing nets that would otherwise be discarded from these very remote villages along the Chilean coastline. And so they ended up financially incentivizing fishermen to bring the damaged nets back to shore. The Boreo team picks them up, sends them to a processing facility where they become pelletized, mm -hmm. and then they're sold to companies like Costa to make products out of. So it's a really interesting way for companies to get started uh, in, in this theory that we've talked about before, one of the solutions is to create a circular economy, right? So how mm. do we make sure that we are reusing all what is traditionally considered waste and bringing that back into the supply chain? So when, and Joe was saying, when people purchase Costa sunglasses, they're actually incentivizing this entire supply chain of yeah. support to get fishing nets back on land and turn into new products. And fishing nets are really one of the top items of concern in the mm -hmm. ocean, because the, if they are discarded at sea, and many are, they will continue to catch marine life forever, right? These, you know, fishing nets are made out of nylon. Originally, they were made out of jute, some kind of rope or hemp or things like that, and yeah. they would degrade eventually. But Modern technologies, that's just not the case. They're, they're designed to withstand some of the harshest ocean conditions imaginable. Mm. And when they are cut loose at sea or discarded in some manner, they will continue to drift forever, catching yeah. and killing along the way. So this, it's really important, an important step in Costa's journey around sustainability. And kick plastic was actually where they started, right? It started from the heart. They were looking at how they could protect the watery world. So where does this cycle start, in your opinion? What came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Maybe it's an easier question. Nets definitely came first. Say again? Nets definitely came first and then recycling those and having the raw material. And so we were able to, as Leah mentioned, incentivize them to get more. So as we're producing more and more sunglasses, they have the opportunity to take more and more out of the ocean, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think that's really interesting. And uh, so, Joe, when you were talking about your relationship with the community, I think that's a, an extremely important um, position to have at your company because you rely on these partnerships with people. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how that works? I mean, what is it that you do? Um, is there any marketing promotions involved or is it just having those close-knit relationships? And if so, how do you actually keep them close? Yeah, that's a great question. So the great thing about Coast in general uh, is community is in everything we do and it's focus and it's what we spend all our time on, not only in the marketing department, but the whole company on the sales front. It's not just in our communities, but working with those communities. Mm -hmm. And so what's really cool for me, you mentioned earlier in a discussion about 
um, you know, what about cause marketing or sustainability marketing? For me, that's kind of like I cringe a little bit uh, sometimes yep. when I hear that uh, because Coast has been doing it for naturally, you know, for 10 plus years, 15 plus years since 1983 when we started, it's always been front of mind. And so for us, it's really just talking about what we naturally do. You know, not only do we just talk about it, but we are about it. Um, and so it's it's sometimes hard to find the balance because we're doing, you know, we are in the community, eyes down, head down, making this help. But sometimes we forget to talk about it, right? We can see other companies out there like, oh, we are talking about kicking plastic or we're talking about recycling plastic, but they're yeah. not going to do anything. So coming back to what you said about the community, it's being with them, learning what is important to them, uh, yeah. learning about what they're doing and helping amplify that as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, so here's the thing. As a consumer, I am still getting to grips with what plastic solutions means. Um, and I think the more important thing is the magnitude of what it means. And Leah was incredibly helpful last time when we spoke. She actually brought examples of what reclaimed plastic from the oceans looks like, how it actually gets degraded. Um, and then I did a lot more research um, since our call last time with Leah and watching a lot more videos from the ocean cleanup, for instance, watching some of the videos that you guys have produced on your YouTube channel as well. I've really gotten a, a, a bigger idea of just how much plastic there's out there. And I, I came to the realization, it's not just this very well-known Pacific garbage patch that we're talking about, but we're also talking about four other patches. Leah, am I correct in saying so? That's exactly right. So um, the garbage patches are actually plastic that flows from offshore on, let's say, let's just take the North Pacific garbage patch. Yeah. And that it, it's flowing offshore from the United States and from northern part of Asia, and it is circulating around following the Coriolis effect, which is what the mm -hmm. atmospheric wind conditions do, and that's reflected in the ocean. So that is what's happening. And then they start to kind of gather in a rather dense way that is yeah. several thousand miles across. And so Scientists have been documenting plastic pollution in the ocean since the 1970s, but it mm -hmm. wasn't until Captain Charles Moore sailed, he was just kind of sailing from California to Hawaii, like so many do, yeah. and just found himself in a soup of plastic pollution. And this perked his interest and he started a research nonprofit organization. And that was sort of the others now so much research being done about not only what's going on in the North Pacific garbage patch, but the four other garbage patches, North Pacific, South Pacific, North mm -hmm. Atlantic, South Pacific, and accumulation zones in places like the Mediterranean Ocean, the Great Lakes, the Indian yeah. Ocean. These are, it's the amount of plastic, even though we've sounded the warning for 20 years, is still just coming down and we down downstream, essentially. Any piece of plastic, that you find on land and you don't pick up and discard in a proper facility, like a receptacle or anything, yeah. that will eventually get washed or blown into the nearest watershed and make its mm -hmm. way out to a larger body of water and eventually into the ocean. So we're seeing immense concentrations of plastic pollution, especially it, like as I mentioned in the Great Lakes and the Mediterranean Ocean where there isn't the opportunity to disperse. What yeah. happens when plastic enters into the ocean if it isn't ingested by marine life mm -hmm. and or the best thing it could happen is it gets washed ashore and picked up, which is why Ocean Conservancy's work is important, right? Let's we need to clean up all that plastic as yeah. it comes in because that's the best opportunity to do it. It's incredibly costly to clean it up once it's in the ocean. And then mm -hmm. what happens for stuff that doesn't get is on the floating of the surface, it's not ingested by animals, it actually starts to sink to the bottom. So in doing deep ocean research like that is so expensive. We don't even know how much plastic has already drifted to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. That's just a field we're getting into now in the scientific community. Well, you know, it's interesting. Right now I'm showing a video of the um, CEO of um, the ocean cleanup and he was inspired to do actually something about plastic in the oceans by having visited Greece of all places, he went to Santorini, he went scuba diving, and he just saw just how much junk there was at the bottom of the sea. I mean, and it, I'll tell you, in Santorini, the waters are extremely deep. 
So I don't know how deep he went, but he certainly must have at least saw some of that stuff floating. I mean, I don't know that he ever got to the bottom there, but at least along the edges of the island there. And um, he's he, in this video, he's actually showing just recently the funny or rather interesting stuff that they found by using this net system in the Pacific Garbage Patch. And right here, he's even showing a refrigerator, which I'm completely shocked about. And uh, not to mention a lot of the um, older plastics. I mean, they even found um, degraded plastics of uh, several types of like helmets, um, galoshes. <laughs> I mean, just some very bizarre stuff. And I was just really shocked by all that. And, you know, it's... Um, let me just clear out of this uh, screen right now and get back to kick plastic. There we go. Um, and so I was really shocked about the stuff that people would actually, I actually believe people dispose of willingly into the ocean, not to mention anything like a ship that might capsize or anything that might get blown off the surfaces of a ship as well. And then just imagine what happens with years of accumulated products just floating around and when I saw that uh, documentary of how the Pacific garbage patch flows between Hawaii and the West Coast, California, it's just frightening to see just what kind of stuff one can find there. You know, so um, I, I, I'm actually shocked and that's why I'm, I've been very passionate about this project in particular, doing what I can. And, you know, Leah, last time we spoke about uh, plastic disposable, of pl disposing of plastic, um, one of the things I didn't realize I was doing was throwing my contact lenses down the toilet, right? So that's a big no-no, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, absolutely, right? So uh, one of the early pieces of policy that I was involved in around marine plastic pollution was this idea of rinsing off plastics that we were using to wash our face and brush our teeth with it's okay. they were they're called microbeads and they are exfoliating particles that um, you know were apparently very effective to the market but the end of life solution that the inventors never thought of was once it gets rinsed off your face it goes down the drain mm -hmm. and is not they're so tiny they don't get captured by sewage treatment you yeah. know plants and then they drift like out into the nearest watershed and so contact lenses are like the same thing do not discard do not knowingly discard plastics paint yeah. things like that down the drain so the microbeads were okay. eventually banned in this country and several others so now these microbeads are nothing in comparison to microplastic am i correct well microbeads are a type of microplastic which is a mm -hmm. really great segue so what happens to large pieces of plastic is that when they get out into the environment and if you've ever left like a plastic jug out in the sun and rain you'll see it start to yellow and degrade well that is sped up in the ocean in environment right so plastics actually like when you throw some plastic out into the environment that is not a way plastic never goes away it breaks down into smaller and smaller fragments called microplastics which are smaller than a grain of rice and eventually become even worse nanoplastics and that is of high concern because nanoplastics have the opportunity have the ability to cross like the blood brain barrier the placenta the barrier and we're seeing plastics in research, and data is so incredibly important to fuel change, in, we're seeing plastics in the placenta of unborn babies. And babies are being born with plastic in their system that's excreted with their, their first poop. And this is alarming news because we don't understand yet the human health impacts of ingesting plastic it's in our food chain. So all of us if you are most likely, um, you know, unless you're just like drinking pure water, we're all have the ability to like ingest plastics. And yeah. science doesn't yet know what are the human health impacts of that. And plastics carry a lot of chemicals with them. And that is like the other side of this coin. So this is not good news. And ultimately we need to figure out how to turn off that, that tap of disposable plastics. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joe, what's your experience with, um, with what Leah is talking about? What, what are, you, are you guys raising any awareness in particular to end users like myself about um, 
the concerns around plastic? Yeah, so we, again, Costa is in the community, right, in a fun way, and we want to make sure that we're not just preaching, right? We want to connect mm -hmm. with those consumers and yeah. teach them lessons that they're excited about and can bring home. So that's the whole point of Kick Plastic is, as you mentioned, it sticks with you, right? It has an action mm -hmm. to get rid of it. And yeah. so what we do is we bring Kick Plastic to everything we do. So as small as it, you know, just for all of our staff, we have reusable mm -hmm. water bottles that we bring around and use. Okay. And it's like, you know, we give each other crap for not having it right and we encourage positively that change and be like hey that's one step and we have you know recyclable silverware that leah's team gifted to our team as well that we use and so mm -hmm. those small kind of positive encouragements that one-to-one -one, there you go that one-to-one -one level is what makes Excellent. a difference so when we sponsor tournaments and events we don't just come in with product which is great or cash which is great but we'll come in and sponsor a happy hour with metal cups or with a partner okay. like ball that has recyclable aluminum cups and make it something cool to have and remind them of that they're bringing that kick plastic cup. I saw that Costa event that might motivate me to do one more thing, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. So you do a lot of PR events, um, uh, like on the ground, you mean you guys are actually out there and mingling and engaging with people. Um, are you doing anything else in particular to promote awareness? For sure. So part of the kick plastic program is our kick plastic guide and outfitters program. So we work with, we have our Costa pros, right? So they, they wear Costa sunglasses, they promote them, they get some discounted gear. We set up our pros, guides, lodges, ambassadors, et cetera, that are on the water with reusable water bottles and they help yeah. encourage their clients. So, you know, we have clients like um, our guides in the Keys that are taking 300 clients a year, maybe sometimes twice or sometimes three times a day. And the amount of water they have to drink in the hot sun, if they're able to have, you know, gallon Yeti or, any clean canteen or other brands to have, then that's a way for them to then encourage their consumers to just bring their reusable water bottle versus using anything like plastic that cannot recycle. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So um, I've also, as a YouTuber and a YouTube professional, I also took a look at your YouTube channel and I was uh, quite impressed with the uh, productions of videos that you guys have there. Um, it's, it's, it's inspiring, uh, comparing yourselves to other brands like Patagonia, for instance, which also does an amazing job with, um, reusability of clothing. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole concept of sunglasses made of reused plastic. I mean, how much of a dent in the market are you actually making with, uh, this kind of product and what kind of opportunities are there still for other types of products made of plastic? reused plastic. So I'll briefly touch on it from our side of point and give Leah the context with some of the other companies and understanding of it. But we just with working with Boreo for the first run we did, the first production, we just came out with our second collection is, you know, over 2 million pounds of recycled fishing nets that helps goes to our raw material, right? So that's just a mm -hmm. small piece in the fishing nets, but then also now we have it in our hat brims, some of our hat brims as well. So obviously yeah. that's not the huge thing. That's just a small piece but it helps them inspire other companies now that they see like, all right, now Patagonia has that in there and et cetera. And Leah can speak exactly to kind of that context of that small number that helps encourage a larger number. Mm -hmm. So Leah, segue Thanks, to you. Joe. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I do want to speak in a little bit more of a context of the movement of change within a corporation, right? It's mm -hmm. not easy to kind of kickstart these new strategies and, like about seven years ago, Costa sat down and said, what are we going to do about all this plastic we're seeing in the places that we love to fish, right? This is not good. And they partnered with nonprofit organizations to better understand this issue and did a plastic audit to see where internally they were using plastic and started to systemically cut things out, um, sing things being single use plastic out of their operations. And it takes a long time. But what Joe is talking about that the Costa basically said, okay, we're starting to understand this, but it's not like we can like withhold this knowledge from others in our industry. And so the kick plastic movement was born from an internal conversation to inspire the fishing and outdoor industry in general. And so things like, you know, going to trade shows instead of wrapping up all the, the pallets in single use plastic wrap, Costa boxes them up in reusable wood boxes, you know, and, and it's just, it's how the employees get engaged and figure out, and this is really, really important for anyone listening, every single person that's listening can be the change in the environments that they are working or studying in. You just have to bring an idea and 
put the plan in place and incentivize your teammates to join in. We all know it's the right thing to do, but people sometimes don't know how to get started. So if it's like silverware or, or sorry, it's um, reu like reu this is reusable bamboo from to go wear, mm -hmm. Chico bag to go wear, or Yeti reusable bottles, things like that. Those are reminders to the team at large to start to think kick plastic in their everyday operations. So what Costa and you know Joe and myself, we're here to say, look, it's all about progress. <laughs> Perfection is very hard to achieve, especially yeah. in the in the world of business that we have today. But by partnering with organizations by Boreo, by piloting projects, and Costa started working on the Untangled collection years before bringing. You know, it took a while to bring it to market because Costa's eyewear products. You know, the number one thing is that it, they're durable, right? And they can withstand all the harsh conditions that Costa's con con community of consumers put them through out in the water. And so it's got to be durable and all that testing takes time. And sometimes it's hard to like, this issue is so pervasive. It's a global crisis. And, but we still have to go through some processes to pilot, test, prove the concept, and then have a successful run at market and then put more money into it. So it's a, these systems we need everybody on board to be thinking like this. Mm -hmm. So in the last few minutes, I've heard several things from you and from Joe. Joe mentioned incentivizing people to use um, like those reusable water bottles. So that's one thing. Since we're talking about how do we make people, people's mindset change. You mentioned kicking plastic altogether. So you brought up the use of bamboo forks and knives and spoons, which is really cool packaging made of anything else other than plastic. And specifically, what do you got there? Uh, so obviously being a surfer, I've always got my sunscreen. This is reef safe <laughs> sunscreen by a cutting edge company called All Good. And it was wonderful. She, the woman that runs this company, she worked with the Five Gyres Institute, just like Costa did um, mm -hmm. in the early days, trying to understand the issue and get knowledgeable about it and bring a product packaging to market that could um, be in something other than plastic. So these type, and it was also reef safe sunscreen, which is a whole other issue. So, so these kinds of innovations are what we need. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's this, uh, so it's an aluminum tin. Sorry, you get right. to see, I use it a lot. Um, it's zinc, it's mineral-based sunscreen. Oh, okay, so, but we're talking the packaging isn't made of plastic. Is that what differentiates that from other products? Exactly. Oh, okay, exactly. I get you. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. same like this company, uh, they, do, they do shampoo and conditioner bars. Lush mm -hmm. Cosmetics does the same thing, but it's in this reusable metal travel tin. And there's no, when I'm done, I just get a, when I'm done with the bar, there's, that's it. And I, I yeah. get a, a new bar to put in the travel tin. So these ideas of reuse, right? Circular in nature, super important. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Joe, as a, um, I would dare call you guys as pioneers in, um, in, in new types of products using plastic. Would, would you agree with that term? I can't personally take credit for that, but the company definitely, you know, John Sanchez okay. and their product team for sure. Um, and I think they would be very proud to take that on. Um, and I can't speak exactly to what they're also pioneering behind the scenes now. They yeah. kind of get looped in as it gets to the final bit, but I will tell you, it is part of all, every one of their decisions. Right. So what this suggests to me is me as a consumer, I'm actually much more keen to purchase day-to-day -day utensils, uh, clothing, you name it, um, from companies that have a sustainability strategy, or I wouldn't even think that it's a strategy per se, because you guys are doing it because you want to. It's, it's something that's part of the way your ethos is, your, your philosophy to living life today. So although one could say that it is a sound strategy and it is timely as well, um, a, a additional solution to me as a consumer to make a difference in the world today is to also actively look for, for companies that are actively doing something like you guys are. And that really represents me as a progressive individual. Um, and I believe that can very well resonate with lots of other consumers around the world. And 
What is the trend? What's the tendency in your opinion, Joe? For other companies doing the same thing or as a consumer? Um, as a consumer and a company. Yeah, I would say consumers, I think uh, it's, again, my point of view when I go out to events and work in the community is make it cool to do that, right? And it's not like it's easy. It doesn't happen overnight. So I would say other brands are definitely picking up on that. So as you mentioned, kind of being a pioneer in the product space, that's putting our mouth uh, where put our action where our mouth is. And so I think mm -hmm. other companies like, oh shoot, how do we do that? How do we be like Costa? Yeah. How do we kind of promote this? So I think that's definitely a wave of change. And then, and the, that wave of change is coming on the company side because consumers see it, right? And we make products, not every, just, you know, totally be transparent. Not every one of our sunglasses is made of recycled fishing nets, but every mm -hmm. one of our sunglasses may be beat up and reused and used for many years. And we also have a great repair and warranty system to take care of that. So it's not yeah. like a, single use sunglass that's like, oh, I broke it. I'm going to use it. We take care of our things and we want it yeah. to be used. As Leah kind of deferred to earlier, right? That we need to put this through the ringer. So kind of a cool story Absolutely. of the Untangled series now versus before. Sunglasses uh, are either an eight base, which means it's wrapped or a six base. They could be other bases. But when we first made the Untangled collection, they're only six base. So mm -hmm. it was cool to wear it, but you wouldn't necessarily perform on the water with it. The newest yeah. Untangled 2.0 came out with the 8 base. There's an additive in it to make it still as durable, but wrapped so it covers all the sun. So our okay. fishermen could not only wear it just to support the idea, but wear it mm -hmm. to perform their day-to-day -day jobs as guides and fishermen on the water. How do you harvest it all? I and mean, if I what, could the logistics in. involved in this must be crazy. Wait, the I just, wait, wait, can I just hop in real quick? Yeah, go I ahead, think Leah. it's really important. Yeah. Costa's core community of, of pros and ambassadors and core consumers, they love this product because they are seeing the plas plastic everywhere, right? They're like us, yeah. we're on the water seeing it. Yeah. And But when we came out with the first round, right? The first pilot of Untangled Collection back in 2018, their feedback helped change Costa's approach, which was highlighted by Joe. So consumers have a lot of opportunity to help guide the brands that they love, right? To, mm -hmm. to do better. And that is an example of it. Sorry, back to your question. Oh, you're good. Absolutely, no, no problem at all. Well, Joe, I'm very happy to say that I see on your website, you've actually got uh, prescription um, glasses as well, which is something that I'm very keen about. So I'm very excited yeah, about that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And um, what, what would you say is your most popular range? As far as what? Popular like series of sunglasses or popular yeah. lens? So I guess, so we're known for a couple of things. Number one is glass versus poly. So a lot of sunglasses mm -hmm. are made from poly or plastic. Our okay. sunglasses, we sell a majority of glass and glass tends to, one of the drawbacks is a little bit heavier, but is extremely more scratch resistant and clearer. So our, mm -hmm. our consumers are using this to fish and to sight fish and see clearly. So they are willing to make the investment of up to 60 or $100 more per pair to have glass lenses instead of poly lenses for many different okay. reasons, the sustainable durability. And then when you look and see that middle pair there, that blue mirror, we're mm -hmm. also known for our mirrored lenses. That helps cut down glare when you're fishing. And so our uh, slide the other way, that's silver mirror, which is still another good mirror. But uh, blue mirror and green mirror are two popular lenses again. These because, two right here? Um, uh, just the blue in the middle, the green you can't see, but it's okay. Uh, but that blue mirror lens is similar to blue is for offshore, blocks that harsh mm -hmm. light and you're in the blue water. Um, yeah. Cuts down that glare. And then we're sure we have a green mirror lens. So mm -hmm. it's definitely, you'll see our product line is heavily influenced by fishermen, even though it can be enjoyed by all. That's awesome. And, and one of the things I also noticed is that the company is owned by Luxotica, if I'm not mistaken, or yeah. at least, yeah. is, it, is it fully owned or is it? Yeah. So we used to be owned by uh, a different parent company that now merged with Luxotica. And so there was a big worry in the space to say, all right, Costa is in, you know, this big conglomerate, which is it's plus pluses and minuses. And mm -hmm. definitely as an employee on the front line was, how is this going to affect my job? But I'll say the cool thing to see is the reason we were picked up into this uh, organization and the portfolio is to be the conservation brand, which right. is exciting. Number one, because it gets to still do the work. I get to stand for the cause and work with my cause partners and stand for making a difference, but then also it's going to take a lot of work, but help internalize in within Luxotic, which is a huge, huge organization. So sometimes it's easier to do the work on the inside. And I'm also happy to say that there's tons of work being done on the inside, not only with the Costa brand, but with many other brands we work with to see circularity. And Lee and I were on a call last week to see different programs to make that where 
not only the Costa brand that we stand on it, but for all those brands. And now that gives us a larger power, not just our Costa brand, but this humongous global organization. So it gives me a little positive light that we can make a difference. Absolutely. I mean, as far as strategies goes, teaming up with someone like Luxottica is definitely the way to go because they've got such huge uh, presence throughout the world. Although to end users, Luxottica is probably not so well known as a brand name because there's so many different brand names under that under the the overall Luxottica name. But um, well, let me tell you this: I'm I'm very happy to tell you that you've sold me on Costa glasses, so I'm definitely going to be interested in. Uh, trying some of those out. My biggest concern is this. Now, previous to speaking to Leah several weeks ago about plastic pollution, I hadn't known about Costa sunglasses. So I'm just curious, um, is there an opportunity for, for more marketing of the brand? Is it much more uh, US centric? Is, it, um, is there an opportunity to branch out to more uh, international markets? Yeah, so that has always been the goal. We're definitely, we are a Florida-born company down the southeast of Florida where the most fishermen mm -hmm. are not only in the country, but in the world. Um, yeah. And so we are growing not only nationally, but now as part of Luxottica, we will be growing globally. And I think that is an awesome opportunity. Got mm -hmm. off a previous call earlier talking about expansion to many other places. So part of that structure is how do we go into these different markets? And it will always be going into these markets as that cause brand that cares for making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm hoping we, you know, write down this date today in three years or five years, you're like, wow, I see it everywhere. And you can say, hey, I was the first one to wear them over here, which is pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, I'd love to become a consumer of these products as soon as possible. And may I give you a bit of a uh, shameless little bit of promo here? I mean, if you are in the lookout for, on the lookout for a YouTube marketer or a video marketer, hey, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very proud to be associated with brands like yours that actually make a difference. Um, and it's such an exciting time to be part of something like that. Coming, coming from the automotive market myself, I'm very excited to see how the automotive uh, trade is changing into the directions of electric vehicles. And that's also very exciting yeah. as well. So um, sure. I think the, the general... Uh, theme about plastic, generally speaking, is, is very much involved in all kinds of industries, you know, from creating yeah. mobile phones, plastics inside mobile phones, to sunglasses, to contacts, you name it, and even uh, makeup products or anything that we need to use for, for our own personal care, toothbrushes, for instance. So, I mean, it's just incredible. Um, what I have a question for the both of you is uh, we got one of our viewers who's asking, or actually says, great topic, very informative. Um, is it true sea turtles consume plastic bags thinking they are jellyfish? Who wants to answer that? We'll let Leah go. <laughs> the answer is sadly, yes. There's mm -hmm. seven species of sea turtles in the world and they have all been documented to ingest plastic. And they do, jellyfish is one of their primary foods. And I think we've seen those haunting images of plastic bags floating in the ocean, looking exactly like jellyfish. So that is unfortunately true. And I okay. live in Charleston, South Carolina, as I previously mentioned. And the, there's a sea turtle hospital in the South Carolina aquarium that receives mm -hmm. sea turtles from up and down the East Coast. And they are increasingly seeing by a hundredfold that sick turtles coming in have plastic in their gut and mm -hmm. extracting that is incredibly challenging. Oh my, oh my. Well, you know, the time is now, I think as far as um, we're concerned with today's topic, plastic pollution. And if you're just joining this live stream, we're talking about Team C's, the campaign led by the YouTube community influencers, also known as Mr. Beast and Mark Rober. Um, and I'm very proud to be associated with uh, this campaign as a YouTube professional myself. And I'm extremely excited to have these two knowledgeable guests, one of them being uh, Leah Colabello, who is also a TED Talker. If I didn't mention that at the very beginning, she made an amazing TED Talk. So I would highly encourage you to go and check that out. Um, she works with a lot of companies to help them develop their sustainability strategies. Um, anywhere you want to correct me if I'm wrong, Leah, but I think I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Joe's part of a great company that actually is very much part of everyday life, especially where the sea is concerned, using reused and recyclable and recycled durable plastic for some incredible uh, glasses uh, made of 
different colors and I'm definitely going to be trying one of those uh, pairs out very, very soon. Leah, awesome. I would like to ask quickly, um, what is it that you do with companies like Costa? Is there, is, is it something that you've been doing for some time now? I mean, obviously you and I go back to uh, business school and <laughs> um, I know that you've always been a very um, avid, passionate person when it comes to the ocean and the seas. Um, to talk a little bit about what you do today with other companies, organizations, uh, tell us a little bit more about that. With pleasure, because I'm really excited about the work that we do. So when we met, I was working in international business. I actually was working in international sports and I ended up going to business school and transitioned into ocean conservation. So I worked all around the world training activists that wanted to protect their coastal regions all everywhere like you know there was bad projects going on pollutants and i started seeing this wide rise of plastic pollution everywhere and that is when i started working i was with the surf rider foundation this international organization that started a big plastics campaign almost 16 17 years ago to draw attention to this issue called Rise Above Plastics. And then I joined an organization that had sprung out of the, I talked about Dr. Charles Moore or Captain Charles Moore before with the Algolita organization. The organization is the Five Gyres Institute. And that's where I really got into this issue and brands started to approaching the Five Gyres Institute saying, how can we do better? We're really concerned. And one of them was Costa Sunglasses. So, mm -hmm. um, so I've started working with brands since about 2013. Like I showed you like one of these, the sunscreen yeah. that I was talking about, that was one project. Um, Costa really started to kick into gear around 2015. And um, it's, we started planning Purpose Solutions, and we're a team of five amazing women that work with organizations across the U.S. and in Europe to help reduce their impacts. And it's not just businesses and brands and big organizations that we work with. We also work with cultural institutions like aquariums and um, municipalities to help with single-use plastic bans, things like that around plastic food service wear. So when we start with an organization, we basically say, what is it you're trying to solve for? And in some cases, it's the amount of plastic that they're using in their operations, events, packaging, retail, back of house. Look at me, I'm like, boom, right in the middle of this shot here, told us. But um, it was, if that's where we spun out. And now companies are asking, like Costa, like we, we're trying to understand our carbon footprint. Can you help? And the answer is absolutely, right? We want to become B4 certified, which is the, the gold standard of corporate sustainability. Yes, we help companies pursue certifications like that. So that's what wow. our team does. That is so interesting. So how does a company, first of all, know that it has to do something sustainable? And what is the driver to get in contact with a company like yours? It usually starts with a pressure, an external, mostly external pressure that's put on them. Perhaps they, their customers are complaining, love your product, hate your packaging, or activist investors in ESG mm -hmm. um, are in, it's, it's a class, it's kind of a class that is what sustainability falls under in environment, social good governance is, yeah. it's, it's invest, it's a, um, kind of a universal term for that in the business world, or it's a retailer like REI, which is a beloved outdoor brand um, retailer here in the, the U.S., saying, we want to know about your sustainability strategy. And so we get contacted because companies don't have one and they need to launch one. And that's where we come into play. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's industry pressures, especially in the outdoor industry with a leader like Patagonia on the ground, you know, having proof of concept, right? When we, we do mm. the right thing, because it's the right thing to do, then our business grows. And then we can amplify the good work we do in the world, right? So there's a lot of different pressures that a company is trying to address. And then there's an internal champion on the executive team that will say, I I'll take this on. And then yeah. that's who we start to communicate with. And the goal okay. for our organization, yeah, to get it to stick is we tie it to a company's purpose. That's part of our name, Planet Purpose Solutions. 
And then we, our own purpose is to equip current and future leaders to be champions of change because we're not going to do it by ourselves. Our team of five women, it's, mm. we're doing our best, but we have to scale it. So when we get to work with people like Joe Gugino at Costa Sunglasses and the entire Costa Sunglasses team, yeah. that is scaling the opportunity to drive change in the world around, especially this issue of plastic pollution. So obviously I'm, I'm very excited to hear your, your, um, what you're doing. And I think that's, just kudos to you, Leah. Really, I mean, I've I've never doubted your passion is what's driving all this forward and getting together with someone like uh, with Joe today and many other companies. Um, obviously, Costa, for example, has probably gotten in into sustainability from the get go because it's something that represents their philosophy. But what about other companies that don't know that they need to be more sustainable? Um, how does someone approach you? Or if I were to reverse the question around. What kind of companies would you actually want to see connecting with you? It's a great question. We were, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go no, that's you, Joe. That's you, Joe. Well, I was just going to say, and Leah can add to it, but the great thing about Kick Plastic, we talked about it being an internal push in the consumer facing Kick Plastic Guidance Outfitters. Part of our goal as we're diving into 22 is working with Kick Plastic brand partners. And a lot of companies are already doing these things naturally because they want to, but now we're mm -hmm. able to work with because of the great um, model we put together with Leah and her team is now bring and partner with those different brands. So different brands like Yeti already doing it or Suzuki or just people mm -hmm. like a brand Breedlove Guitars they never even heard of. They love what we're okay. doing in the fishing space and they recognize it. So they come to us wow. and they say, hey, we want to know and we're able to share Leah's team and work and then brand together, right? So then it looks really cool. You go to an event and you see all these brands talking about Kick Classic. And it's like, hey, I want to be part of the cool club too. And all you got to do is continue to show the efforts of kicking plastic. That's amazing. I mean, I just I just hope that more and more people get involved with, with this. Uh, I don't even want to call it a sustainability strategy only because it makes you cringe, Joe. So... <laughs> 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 I love that it's a strategy. I'm just saying it's always been our strategy. It's more the talking yeah. about it. as long as they want to add it to what they're doing, which is, you know, what they follow through Leah's team and what we've done, then that's great. Take that to go all the way through it. So if there was one thing, just one thing that businesses would need to do better to help help kick plastic, what would that be? Joe and then Leah. Say that one more time. If there was just one thing that businesses would need to do better when it comes to kicking plastic, what would that one thing be? To kicking plastic, it's uh, one thing that's you easy is the water bottles, right? That shows the commitment. But I okay. would say the one thing internally is asking that question and asking it over and over again. As Leah mentioned, as a consumer on the outside, you can make a difference. But if you're asking that internally and everyone's asking it, then everyone's kind of on board. So asking the question and make feeling comfortable to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Leah, what about you? What's the one thing? Finding the champion to lead within the corporation that has the, the power, both, you know, the relationship power, as well as the resources to drive the change. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it. And then once you have that person to assess, yeah. assess your footprint, your single use plastic footprint, because then that's the data that you need to work off of to solve for. But if you don't know, if it's kind of just out there and no one's studied it, um, then, then you're only delaying the starting point. So better to know and get it over with, you know, okay. and, and address it. How does a company know that they need to be more sustainable? What are the warning signs? Everybody needs to be more sustainable. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It's just keep looking at it, right? So it's just find, as Leah said, making that assessment or find the person to see. It's like find the thing that's kind of two parts. One that's the easiest thing to tackle and one that will be the most significant difference. So if one's, if one's both, great. If not, do one thing so you can make a difference and show that. But start tackling the biggest, the biggest uh, difference maker. Even this Patagonia needs to a be a barrier to entry. I'm terribly sorry, Leah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You mentioned about Patagonia. I said, even, even Patagonia needs to be more sustainable and they know it, right? And that they continue to invest in it. And that's okay. the important thing. That's very important. Absolutely. I mean, I was going to just mention uh, what, what are the barriers to entry for even a small business 
or an individual, but when we're looking at bigger businesses, what are the prohibitors for actually doing that? Is it too cumbersome, too time intensive, too costly? Who cares? What do you think? I mean, probably all of the above. <laughs> Yeah, I would think that it's definitely cost rate and putting the budget aside to make it. I would say, you know, the part that you mentioned had me cringe before about talking about it is mm -hmm. now that before it was like, hey, I want to make this investment, but it didn't make a difference, right? We yeah. brands, like at least to the consumer now, make the investment. It takes that money. But if you just talk about making that investment, now it's good for two things. You're making a difference and your consumers want to know those yeah. companies that are doing it. So mm -hmm. the reason it just makes me cringe is when people talk about it and don't make the difference. So if you're willing yeah. to invest in it, and then show that, boom, go for it. That's going to help you out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Leah, you mentioned to me in our last call that um, there's still not enough being done. Uh, you, you quoted some alarming statistics about companies that are not doing enough or the countries that are not doing enough. Um, do you want to add a little bit to that? I think you said it, Dolis. <laughs> We, we, everyone, yeah, we, we need to, I mean, plastic pollution is, is, is just this terrible crisis, right? And it's affecting, it affects everyone. It's going to, it affects human health. We don't actually know the data because mm. it's, the data is hard to gather on humans, okay. right? About, oh, if you ingested, can you please adjust this plastic and then we'll cut you open and figure out how that arm sure. you, right? We don't do that kind of stuff. So what, but also climate, climate change, right? Like plastic is part of the climate change conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we, we spoke about a, uh, a triangle of sorts, meaning you got your manufacturers, you got your governments, NGOs, and then you got your end users. Everyone kind of is part of the same little uh, ecosystem, so to speak, and everyone's got to do their, their, their share. Um, I came down Actually, I came up with seven to, let's see, nine different actions personally that um, came to my mind about what I can do as a consumer. So one of the first thing is don't panic, but implement some small habits that make a big difference. Okay, so one of those examples is don't throw my contact lenses down the toilet. <laughs> um, buy reusable plastic products or kick plastic altogether when you can. So there you go. You got that one example. Leah, you got the example of the forks, the bamboo, uh, and is it bamboo or is it wooden? Right. And then you've got the packaging for the sunscreen. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I just loved what you said when we spoke last time, vote with your wallet. Consumers have the uh, ability to make a choice. Um, you went so far as to say, go back to the supermarket manager and return all of your plastic that you've used from packaging. And do you want to know something that I actually did that? And the guy kind of looked at me kind of funny, but he knew where I was coming from. <laughs> so um, that was fun. Uh, the other thing also is just reuse plastic bags. Um, look for repurposed or reused types of um, clothing, even sunglasses in this instance. Actively look for companies that are doing something to help the environment like Costa Sunglasses uh, or organizations like Team C's. Look to influencers. Um, and another thing that really resonated with me last time I spoke to Richard Brubaker, a good friend of ours, Leah, he also talked about keeping it communal, keeping it local, um, actively doing things with your local community to as simply do something just like going to the local shore, whether it's a river, a lake, or a sea, or an ocean front, go there and just collect plastic or garbage with a bunch of people in your community. And it's all those little actions that actually um, make kicking plastic fun. One of my buddies, uh, Philip Ammerman, who was on my third interview, he was very much involved with keeping one of the beaches near his house in Athens, not far from Marathon. Um, he was actively going out there and getting people together on a Saturday morning to go and clean up the beaches, which I have found just extraordinary and extremely uh, a good example of leadership by actually doing, leading by doing, and that's what I really appreciated. And so he's... Uh, Great guy to connect with. 
And ultimately, um, because of what we're doing today is if you are a YouTuber or if you're very much involved with um, influencers on YouTube like Mr. Beast, Mark Rober, you know, these are people that also care about the environment. And what we're doing is uh, driving that awareness through the YouTube community, through the YouTube channels. People come to YouTube specifically because they're there to watch video. So what I can only encourage to companies to do who want to get their message out even more is really invest time in one of the most powerful mediums today, and that is video, regardless of if, whether it's on YouTube or any other platform. But using video as a way to spread the message, show what you guys are doing um, from whether it's me as a consumer, as a video marketing professional, uh, or you as a company, if you really want to get that message out, depending on what the customer journey is, there's a video for every level of the customer journey from awareness all the way down to the purchase decision in your sales funnels. So video is something that could very well benefit um, many companies who want to drive that awareness because let's face it, driving this level of awareness can be quite costly. Wouldn't you agree? Sure. Exactly. And you can create communities online as well. And through what we're doing right now, having discussions like live streams or having videos posted of the things that people are doing within your community is actually a very fun thing to do. One of the last things I researched about was also the interesting topic of gamification. Gamification is something that also resonated with me with one of our mentors, Leah, back at Thunderbird, who was way ahead of his time. Uh, gamification is really becoming a thing, especially with applications. Um, there are apps out there. Uh, now, the name escapes me, but I'll probably do another video on that in one of my upcoming videos. There are apps that actually make recycling plastic or taking care of the environment fun. And you can give yourself award systems that help your friends and other people within your community to actually make it so much more fun. So gamification, I think, is a an interesting, innovative concept that still needs to be driven forward. Uh, another friend of mine, Lon Safko, he's a professional innovator. He goes way back to having created the first uh, human-machine interface uh, with computers, similar to what Stephen Hawking used as well. Um, he's been racking his mind. I said, hey, Lon, what are we going to do to uh, improve how people look at plastic and how we can help people kick it? So we're actively trying to come up with some innovative ideas. I think gamification might be one of those. I don't know, what do you guys think? Every one of you watching this video, whether it's live now or on replay, your opinion does matter. Please let us know what you think. You know, we're down to the hour now and I just wanna say thank you to Joe, thank you to Leah, you guys have been great. I really appreciate the time you've made on Friday to join me this evening on here in Europe and this afternoon back in the States. Are there any last sort of um, um, last minute thoughts or messages you want to let our viewers know? I definitely have to jump and I appreciate you having me, but the one thing, Kick Plastic, I love how that stuck with you. And one of our <laughs> uh, Costa Pro ambassadors took it a little bit farther for himself and he kind of coined the term one piece a day. So when he's out fishing, you can see on social okay. media and people sharing those stories, Carter Andrews. So I would say Kick Plastic, one piece a day, even if you're seeing it, do multiple pieces a day that little action of seeing it uh, can mm -hmm. help inspire somebody else too. That's awesome. All right. That sounds good. We'll see you guys later. Thanks, Talis. Joe, thanks a lot for joining us. Have a great weekend. It was <laughs> real, really fun. It. Hi again. So Talis, we just want to say thank you so much for having us on. And these kinds of platforms are so important to getting to know new audiences. And one of the, because I've been working on this issue for so long, one of the issues that I've noticed is that we're always onboarding young people who are just mm -hmm. learning about this, right? And yeah. these kinds of opportunities are really important. So um, I'll, I'm here as a resource. If anybody out there has any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I did want to kind of close. I had mentioned it earlier that each one of us affects change, right? And mm -hmm. during our first podcast back in, or sorry, YouTube opportunity back in October, as you mentioned, yeah. I, I kind of threw out there that there's a formula for change. And it's one of the most important formulas any one of us will ever know. And I've kind of given great thought to something that I heard the marine biologist and, and climate change expert, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, I heard her speak mm -hmm. 
maybe about six or seven years ago in New York. And, and she said something that I reflected upon and sort of have evolved um, a little bit more. And I, I just saw her a couple months ago and I told her about this. And mm -hmm. it really is to drive change in this world, the change that we need to see, right? We need data, we need science. And the science around marine plastic pollution triples every year, like Moore's law's got nothing on this. And we need all that data, like I was quoting about, you know, plastics in the placenta of unborn fetuses, right? These sorts of things, children, you know, like babies being born with poop in their gut, right? Like, I'm sorry, plastics in their gut. These kinds of data, this is escalating and we need more and more and more of it because that mm -hmm. data informs change makers and change makers are not just like influencers and things like that, but they're artists, they're activists, they're nonprofit organizations, they're YouTubers, right? Mr. Beast and Mark Ro uh, Robert. Robert, yeah, I keep on wanting to say Robert, yeah. like he's French. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, um, Mr. Beast and Mark Robert. But these influencers are critically important because they inform culture, right? So data informs change makers, change makers inform culture, yeah. and culture informs people, and people inform policy, business as well as at the ball at the ballot box, right? Like government mm -hmm. and business. People dr can drive this change. But if they don't know or don't know what to do, yeah. that is where influencers like you, the YouTuber community is so critical. So thank you so much, Tolis, for hosting this series of talks so that we can connect through the Team C's initiative on such a critical issue. Thanks very much again, Leah. And for those of you watching all the way through to the end, thank you very much. And don't forget, the whole reason we're doing this is to raise awareness, to help you make some decisions. I'll be coming out with a video summarizing some of my key thoughts and actions that you can take as a consumer and as a business. You know, uh, we're here to support Team C's and all you need to do is go to teamc's.org and join the team by making a very small donation or as large a donation as you want. We're trying to get to 30 million by the end of the year. It's gonna be a very tough one to do, but I think that if there's enough, if there's enough people out there who, are care, who care enough about and and hopefully, just that little bit can actually go a long way by leaving their little drop in the ocean. I'm Tolis Tokianos, helping out with TeamSeas.org. It's been real. Thank you so much for watching, and we will be with you again with some more exciting guests in the weeks to come. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.